Ladies and gentlemen, members of the floor, we are very honored tonight because we have a very great person, we have a very great guest that will be delivering his speech tonight. And I would like to give a brief introduction about Dr. Zaki Naik. Dr. Zaki Naik is a medical doctor by professional training. Dr. Zaki Naik is renowned as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. He is the founder of Peace TV Network, the largest religious satellite channel network in the world. He is, 50, he, he is 56 years old. Dr. Zaki Naik clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic hadith, and other religious scriptures as a basis in conjunction with reason, logic, and scientific facts. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks. In the last 26 years, Dr. Zaki Knight has delivered over 2,000 public talks in the USA, Canada, UK, Italy, France, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, Egypt, Yemen, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Botswana, Nigeria, Ghana, Gambia, Algeria, Morocco, Sri Lanka, Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Hong Kong, China, Japan, and many, and many more countries, including Trinidad, and Mauritius, Maldives, and many other countries, in addition to numerous public talks in India. In April 2012, his public talk in Kishan, Kish, Kishanjaj, Kishanganj, Bihar, in India was Alhamdulillah, attended by over 1 million people by one of the largest gathering in the world for any religious lecture by a single orator. Alhamdulillah, his talk in Jakarta, Indonesia in April 2017 and in Kota Baru, Kelantan, Malaysia in August 2019 attracted more than 100,000 people. Amongst the billions plus population of India, Alhamdulillah, Dr. Zaki Naik was, rank, was ranked number 82 in the 100 most influential per people in India, list published by Indian Express in the year 2009 and ranked number 89 in 2010. He was ranked number 3 in the top 10 spiritual gurus of India in 2009 and topped the list in 2010. He is ranked amongst the top 70 in the book of the most 500 influential Muslims in the world published by Georgetown University in the last 11 editions from 2011 to 2021. In the list of the top 100 cumulative influence over 10 years, Dr. Zaki Naik was ranked number 79. By Allah's help, he has successfully participated in several symposiums and dialogues with prominent personalities of other faiths. His public dialogue with Dr. William Campbell of USA on the topic the Quran and the Bible in the light of science held by Chicago USA in April 2000 was resounding success. His interfaith dialogue with prominent Hindu guru Sri, da Sri Ravi Shankar and on the topic of the concept of God in Hinduism and Islam in the light of sacred scriptures held at Palace Grounds, Bangalore on the 21st January 2006 was highly appreciated by people of both religions. Sheikh Ahmad Didat, the world-famous orator on Islam and comparative religion, who had called Dr. Zaki Naik as Didat Plus in 1994, presented a plaque in May 2000 with the engraving awarded to Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik for his achievement in the field of da'wah and the study of comparative religion. He said, Son, what you have done in four years had taken me more than 40 years to accomplish, alhamdulillah. Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Vice President of Prime Minister of UAE and Ruler of Dubai, Alhamdulillah, presented the prestigious Dubai International Holy Quran Awards Islamic Personality of 2013 Award on, two, on the 29th July 2013 for providing outstanding services to Islam and Muslims at the global level in media, education and philanthropy to Dr. Zaki Naik, along with a cash reward of UAE dirhams, 1 million US 272,000, which he promptly donated 
to start a walk of endowment fund for Peace TV Network. Dr. Zakir, at 47 years old, was the youngest recipient of the award. And one more thing, ladies and gentlemen, especially the people of Perlis, our Agong, our previous Agong, Tuanku Abdul Halim Mu'azam Shah, the King and Head of State of Malaysia, conferred Dr. Zakir Naik the highest award of Malaysia, which is Tokoh Ma'al Hijrah Distinguished International Personality Award for the year 2013 for his, for his significant service and contribution to the development of Islam on the 5th November 2013. Also presented to Dr. Zaki was a citation plaque signed by the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Datuk Sri Muhammad Najib Tun Razak. Sheikh Dr. Sultan bin Muhammad Al Qasimi, ruler of Sharjah, presented Dr. Zaki Naik the Sharjah Award for Voluntary Work for the year of 2013 on 16 January 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, kalau nak baca ni memang sampai habis, tak sudah tuan tuan. So without further ado, I would like to invite the one and only Dr. Zaki Naik to present his speech to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, members of the floor, please welcome Dr. Zaki Naik. For information, ladies and gentlemen, after his talk, we will open for a Q&A session, right? And all of you will be given the rules and regulation so that we can help the Q&A session accordingly, inshallah. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Zaki Naik. Can I have second camera, Hasmal? Second camera. The mid. Mid, mid. The mid. Had. The mid. Mid, mid camera. The last one. The three fourth is fine. The mid one. The mid camera. Hadi, are you put? Hadi, have you? Hadi, the last camera should be three. Close, mid. Yes, Hadi, you made a mistake, yes. That's fine. Little bit wide. Bit more wide. Yes, perfect, fine. So can I show the three-fourth? Okay, can I have a look? A three-fourth can be a little bit tight. Oh, fine, it's fine. It's fine. And the last one? Okay, that's fine. Okay. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma abad. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa man ahsanu qala min man dhai lallahi wa amilu salihaun. Wa qala inna nil muslimin. Makaru makarallahu wallahu khairul makarin Rabbi shalli sadri Wa yassilli amri 
wahl ul uqdat min lisani yafqahu qawli i welcome all the people present in this putra mosque in kanganga palace as well as the millions of viewers that are watching on the peace tv network the peace tv english the peace tv urdu the peace tv bangla and the peace tv chinese as well as the social media platforms which are the facebook the youtube and the alida platform i welcome all of you with the islamic greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of almighty god be on all of you <clears throat> it is my pleasure and my honor to be once again back to perlis after a gap of more than 2 years i have come here several times in 2017 2018 and 2019 and because of this pandemic the covid-19 in 2020 and 21 i did not give any talks all my talks had been cancelled or postponed and alhamdulillah i'm lucky that in the beginning of this new year 2022 amongst all the invitation that was pending alhamdulillah this is my first talk after the pandemic has reduced alhamdulillah it's my pleasure to be back with the people of perlis i think perlis has become my second home <clears throat> and about 9 days ago the mufti of perlis dato mohammad asri zainul abidin mela protect him he called me to discuss on the topic of today's talk and he suggested that i speak on the topic zakir naik my life and my story initially i was reluctant because of falling into the trap of satan as many of you may be aware that one of the major sins in islam is riya it is arrogance it is pride and the satan is specifically behind those people who are successful and closer to allah so we as dais should be very careful not to fall in the plan of the satan and i would not like to be among those people who blowing down trumpet and falling into this but dr maza as he is called in the short form the mufti of perlis mashallah very knowledgeable person and very close to me and explained to me that the purpose is so that i can inspire the muslim ummah the youngsters and the others to come closer to allah subhanahu wa taala and i agreed with him reminding me of the incidents in the year 2015 when i went to take advice from sheikh abdul aziz tarifi according to me amongst the living islamic scholars in the world according to me one of the greatest living islamic scholar today in the world is sheikh abdul aziz tarifi and is very close to me because there was a advisor of mine and we have been even taking advice from mckinsey i don't know how many of you are aware of mckinsey it is one of the most reputed consultation firm in the world which has branches in most parts of the world so one of the advisors they told me that if you want to increase in dawa you have to make a brief profile of yourself make a book talking about yourself 
and they advised me to make a book, Dr. Zakir, A Brief Introduction. And I was reluctant. They being expert in the field of advertising and marketing, they are doing their job. I was reluctant. And when the book was made by my staff, Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, it came out very well. Hardcover, very good paper, very good printing, something unique. But I was scared. I was scared to give it to anyone, thinking that I may lose all the thawab that I have gained, whatever little bit in my life of serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when I went to Sheikh Abdul Aziz Torefi and I told him that this was the advice I got from my advisor, from McKinsey, and I'm not feeling happy giving this book to anyone. He said, why? Because I don't want to, you know, be falling into the trap of pride, of riya, of arrogance. So Sheikh Abdul Aziz, Sheikh Abdul Aziz Torefi told me, because you're thinking you're feeling bad, that itself shows that you're not proud of yourself, number one. The moment you're feeling bad, that you don't want to give this book to anyone, itself is a sign that you're not doing it for arrogant surprise. Number two, he said the advice given to you was for what purpose? So I told him so that my dawah activity would increase, the people would come to know about my activities and the support would increase, and the reach would be more. Because that book had a lot of achievements, a lot of awards, photographs with heads of states of the world, with top scholars. It came out to be so good that I was afraid. After taking the advice of Sheikh Abdul Aziz Turefi, then I was a little bit relaxed, and I thought to it that I didn't make it public, but gave it only to those people who I thought would benefit the dawah. Nine days back, when the Mufti of Pearl is, Dr. Maza, as he's called by the people who love him, he again came up with the same hikmah, that the purpose is not to show off. And he told me that when you give your life story, many a times people who are successful, they don't tell their story and it is lost. When you say it with your own mouth, many things would inspire the Muslim Ummah and we can make small clips of five minutes, three minutes, four minutes for your full talk. We can make clips so that that would inspire the people all over the world. I told him, Mufti, talking about my life would minimum take two hours. He said, no problem. And I agreed with the suggestion. And today's topic is Zakir Naik, my life and my story, from a stammerer to an Islamic orator, and Hijra from India to Malaysia. Later on, when I started to gather my thought, what should I speak? I realized it's impossible to cover into us. I require minimum five hours. Then when I thought more, no, I require 10 hours. Then when I thought more, I said, no, 20 hours. Then I said, impossible, minimum 25 hours. And but naturally, I can't give a talk for 25 hours. So now I'm in a dilemma. How can I finish my life and my story in two hours? So let me tell you, this will just be scratching the surface. But I decided that inshallah, in the coming few months, I would give a series of talk in my studio. In Putrajaya, maybe for more than 25 hours, trying to fulfill a little bit what Dr. Maza wanted. So that, you know, we can make small clips. 25 hours or more than that. So it will, it will not be lost in wilderness. And I know many a times it would be an inspiration for youngsters. Because today we have two types of thought about dyes. Where I come from India, a dye means miskin. 
poor person not having knowledge of the world at all you know coming from madrasa a different angle to it when we go to some parts of the world where muslims are majority they make dawa as a profession to earn money these extremes and they charge a lot so these are two extremes which we have inshallah maybe my life and my story would be an example for the people to become dais let me tell you one thing in the beginning and i'll conclude with that also that never ever become a dai so that you can earn money in this world as a profession no problem that doesn't mean you can't take salary because all of us know the very famous dua that we do from the quran rabbana atina fid dunya hasnata wa fil akhirati hasnata qina azab an nar oh my lord give me the best in this world and the akhirah and save me from the torment of the hell fire who doesn't know this dua mashallah who knows this dua raise your hand raise your hand mashallah everyone everyone knows this dua mashallah very famous dua now can anyone from here who's not a hafiz can tell me what this dua is from the glorious quran surah baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 201 you may not know the reference i'm telling you does anyone know what comes one verse before this raise your hand who knows what does allah say in the quran one verse before this dua raise your hand anyone who's not a hafiz of quran anyone who's not a hafiz of quran who knows what allah says in the quran one verse before this allah says in surah baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 200 that there are those who pray only for this dunya allah will give you the dunya but will not give you akhirah then allah says the believers are those who pray rabbana atina fid dunya hasnata fil akhirati hasnata qina adhab an nar oh my lord give me the best in this world and the akhirah and save me from the torment of hell fire there's a scholar who rightly said that even in this dua allah is teaching us the maximum you ask for this dunya is one third rabbana atina fid dunya give me the best in this world rabbana atina fid dunya wa hasnata wa fil akhirati wa hasnata give me the best in this world and the best in the hereafter and this is the one third next one third and the last one third is save me from the torment of hellfire so one third is for this dunya next one third is the best in next dunya and the last one third is also save me from the torment of hellfire so two third is for the akhirah and one third is for this dunya so the best dua that we have that allah has taught us in the quran is one third you ask for this dunya and two third for the akhirah allah says in surah hud that all those who ask for this dunya we give you the dunya but not akhirah but those who ask for akhirah allah gives you akhirah as well as this world please let me inform you that before i start my life and my story let me tell you this talk in no way to enumerate the good qualities that i have i don't think so i have many in no way is it to list the awards that i got in no way it is to talk about my achievement let me tell you all whatever little bit i have is haza min fadli rabbi this is only and only because of my lord without allah i am zero that is the reason on my whatsapp dp i have only one dp those who have my whatsapp number on my whatsapp dp i am nothing without allah 
So let me tell you at the outset, Dr. Zakir Naik is zero. Whatever little bit that I've achieved in this life is only and only because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah you will learn that if Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah helps, if Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? This is the verse of the Quran in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse 160, which is number one most important for all Muslims in all activities, whether it be dawah, whether it be worldly, whether it be akhirah. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse 160, if Allah helps you, none can forsake you. If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there, then who can help you? So let the believers, let the moments put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The success of everything is only and only due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will try my level best in this limited two hours that I've got to try and say highlights of some of, you know, because my experiences, mashallah, Allah has blessed me with a lot of experiences which is worth sharing, which would take scores of us, more than 25 hours according to me. I'll just say some of them. I will try and narrate in a chronological order, year wise, but sometimes I may have to club few years together and then come back so that the sequence is maintained. But I'll try and narrate my story in a chronological order year-wise. But sometimes, you know, I may have to club a few things together rather than come back and forth again, up and down. So mostly it will be chronological order. Sometimes I'll go a few years ahead and then come back again. <clears throat> so inshallah, I'll try my level best to speak about Zakir Naik, my life, my story, a stammerer, from a stammerer to an Islamic orator, and Hijra from India to Malaysia. I, Zakir Abdul Karim Naik, was born on the 18th of October, 1965, in the city of Bombay, today known as Mumbai, in the state of Maharashtra in India. Today, I am 56 years, 2 months, and 28 days young. <laughs> my parents, both my parents, they were highly educated. They were broad-minded, and they were practicing Muslims. But even though they were practicing Muslims, they never forced any of us, any of my brothers and sisters, including me, to follow any of the faraiz in Islam. They never forced us, but they were practicing Muslims. So much so that I remember the first time when I observed the fast at the age of three or four, it was against the wishes of my parents. Because how could a three-year-old person fast? But I wanted to fast, and it was against my wishes. I saw my mother praying. I used to join her. They never told me to pray. And alhamdulillah, we were a practicing Muslim following the faraiz, abstaining from haram. Me along with my siblings, we were five, two brothers and three sisters. The eldest was my sister, her name was Zubna. Her name is Zubna, rather. Next is my elder brother, Muhammad. Then my second sister, Naila. My third sister, Salwa. And then me, Zakir. I was the youngest amongst all five. And being the youngest was a little bit more pampered. I did my schooling in St. Peter's High School in Masgon, Bombay, India. 
though St. Peter's High School was managed by a Christian Protestant organization, educational organization, more than 80% of the students we were Muslims. It was a co-ed school. And from school days, I used to avoid talking to girls. I never spoke to any of my classmates who were girls or schoolmates, not because there was any restriction from the deen or from Islam. It was my innate nature not to intermingle with opposite sex. From childhood, I used to stammer. From childhood, from the time I can recollect, I used to stammer. When anyone used to ask me, what is your name? I would say, my name is Za, 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 Zakir. I was, you could say, a born stammerer. Or another English word is stutterer. I used to stutter from childhood. And there are different people who stammer some mild, some moderate. I was an excessive stammerer. So much so that whenever I used to reply, I used to even jump. So when someone asked me, what is the name of my name? Is Zah, 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 then Zakir. So until I did not jump, that keyword would not come out. And I remember many a time when I stood below the doorknob, because I was short, young. And when I used to stammer, and when I used to jump, I used to get a lump on my head. So I was a stammerer, and everyone knew that. So the biggest defect that was there, that I had, and amongst my friend circle, was that I was a stammerer. So it was like a psychological block for me. And in school, mashallah, I was very good in studies, always got every year awards, books, and I was very good in mathematics. Almost all the years I got the best in mathematics award. But there was a subject in our school called as public speaking. And I used to get PF. PF means pass fail. Because the teachers used to have pity on me. Poor stammerer. Poor stutterer. So we'll just pass fail. PF. And I was known. That was my biggest drawback in school. A stammerer. But alhamdulillah otherwise in studies. Mashallah. I, after I passed my school, I joined the Science Junior College, that is Kishanchand Chilaram College, KC College, in Churchgate, Mumbai, and I finished my 11th and 12th, I did my science, and it was my desire, since school days, to become a doctor, like my father, and become a surgeon. So I did my science stream, and then I was later on admitted to the Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College in Belgaum, in Karnataka. The medical college is for three academic years. Each academic year is for one and a half calendar year. So it's the four and a half year studies, then one year internship. I finished my first academic year, and two terms of the second year, and I took transfer to Bombay. And then I joined the Topiwala National Medical College in Bombay, in Bombay Central, also called as Nair Hospital. So I took a transfer in the second year, in 1987. I finished my school in 1982. I did two years of my 11th and 12th, which is also called as A-level. Then joined the medical college in 1984. Took a transfer in 1987, and I came back to Bombay. And my father, Alhamdulillah, he was a medical doctor. His name, Dr. Abdul Karim Muhammad Naik. Rahimullah. May Allah have mercy on him. And me at in Jannah. He was a medical doctor, passed his MBBS, and he was a psychiatrist. A doctor, you know, say of the mental people psychiatrist. At that time, 
very few psychiatrists were there. He was the first Muslim president of the Indian Psychiatric Association. First Muslim psychiatrist. My father came from a very poor background, a humble background. There were 14 siblings, seven brothers and seven sisters. And he was the only graduate in his family. Then he became a doctor, he became a postgraduate. He was born in Ratnagiri, a city in the Kokan region, Maharashtra. And Alhamdulillah, he became one of the most prominent Kokni Muslims of his time. My father, he was so poor, he didn't have money to pay for his school fees or his medical college fees. So what he did? He distributed milk in the morning. He distributed newspaper to earn a few rupees and gather it and pay the fees. And my father was proud. He said, you should never be shy as long as the work you do is honest and it is not un-Islamic. And even I'm not shy to say that my father was a milkman or was a newspaper vendor. I'm proud of it. Alhamdulillah, after he passed his medical studies, he had a flourishing business, so much so that Allah blessed him with a lot of niyama of this world. But when my father, when he started earning, he saw to it, he spent a large portion of his income for the poor, the destitute and the widows. I don't know any needy person who has approached my father and my father did not help him. My father taught us, never be extravagant on yourself, never. But spend on education, no problem. He taught us that invest by helping the poor and the needy. My father used to say, I would never give anyone money to watch a movie. But if you want to buy books, I can give you 10 times more, 100 times more. He loved traveling. He went to several countries. He visited most of the major countries in the world, attending conferences, seminars, whether religious, whether it be medical. My father, alhamdulillah, was a philanthropist. He was very well known for his social activities, for his educational activities, for his religious institutions. He was the president the chairman of umpteen numbers of educational institutions, of social institutions, of religious institutions. I can only give a talk on my father's background for a few hours. I don't intend doing that. But in short, he was very well known. So much so that wherever I went, they used to say, there is the son of Dr. Abdul Karim Naik. But, Alhamdulillah, wherever when I started traveling in the world, almost all the countries I traveled, someone or the other knew my father. Either he helped them for the scholarship fees, or gave them hostel facilities, or gave them medical aid, and Alhamdulillah, that really pleased us when we traveled throughout the world. This was in brief about my father. My father also had a passion of meeting religious personalities and even social and political personalities. He knew most of the religious Islamic figures in India and also some abroad. One of his friends, by the name of Dr. Ali Mate from Cape Town, he used to send him video cassettes of Sheikh Ahmed Didad. And when I came back to Bombay in 1987, we come back to 1987, I hardly saw about one or two cassettes of Sheikh Dida, maybe half, three-fourth. In December 1987, Sheikh Ahmed Dida happens to come to Bombay. And my father tells me, Sheikh Ahmed Dida is staying with my friend, 
Why don't you accompany me? We'll go and meet him. I wasn't really enthusiastic to meet him. But because my father requested to keep my father happy, I went. So me and my brother, we accompanied my father to meet Sheikh Ahmad Didad. I did not know much about him. I had seen him. Maybe half of his video, one and a half. When I went, when we entered the house of my father's friend, we could see that towering personality, six foot three feet. Sheikh Ahmad Didat with a white beard. Impressive. And he told us that I have come to India for a few days. I had been to Tatkeshwar Surat, the place where Sheikh Ahmad Didat was born. And you may be knowing that at the age of six, he went to South Africa, and that's another long story. We won't touch that. So he came to visit his hometown, the place of birth, for a few days, and he was returning back to South Africa. And he said, tomorrow, we went to meet him in the late evening or early night. And he told me, tomorrow, late night, I'm flying back to South Africa. So my father told him, why don't you give a lecture tomorrow? So Sheikh Didar said, how can you arrange a lecture in less than 24 hours? We can start the lecture after Maghrib and your flight is late in the night. He said, how can you arrange? My father said, inshallah, we'll do it. Imagine at that time in 1987, there was no social media. There was no mobile. If you had to do publicity, you had to give an ad in the newspaper. That was a few days before. Late in the night, you cannot give ads for tomorrow. But Sheikh Didat, he agreed. He said, okay, I'm free. I don't mind. Arrange a lecture. So my father, my brother, and myself, I was only 22 years old that time. And my father, because he was involved as in many institutions, for him to get out of him was very easy. He booked the Alma Latifi Hall in Sabu Siddiq in Bombay, which had a capacity of 800 seats. But I was wondering, how could we fill 800 people overnight? And Alhamdulillah, next day, there were more than a thousand people there. Not only more than a thousand people, the creme de la creme of the Muslim community of Bombay were there. The rich businessmen were there, the philanthropists were there, the educationists were there, the film stars were there, only because of Allah, number one. Number two, the popularity of Didad, and lastly because of the contacts of my father. Major, my father did hundreds of phone calls and convinced people to come to Sheikh Didad's lecture. And in less than 24 hours, without any ad, maximum we could do in the morning, print some single color, you know, and stuck it on the walls of the Muslim area. But the major people that came were the personal contact of my father, phoning each one. And I was shocked to see the creme de la creme of the Muslim community of Bombay in large numbers. The hall had a capacity of 800, I think there were more than one and a half thousand people. It was packed. And Sheikh Dida told, I am only concerned about the audio. The audio sound system should be good. And he was impressed. He gave a talk on the topic Islam and other religions. And that's the first time I heard Sheikh Ahmad Didat life. And that was the turning point in my life. In October 1987. And he was impressed that who are these two young boys who could organize in less than 24 hours and get more than a thousand people at that time. So we requested Sheikh Didat, why don't you come again after a few months? And he agreed to come again in the mid-1988. And that time, he came for approximately 10 or 11 days. And we organized 18 lectures of his. And this time, I was more aware of Sheikh Ahmed Didad. He had become my icon. He had become my hero. So when the second time Sheikh Didad came, and Alhamdulillah, 
we organized these talks in auditoriums. All of them were packed on different topics, 18 different topics. Two days they went to Bangalore. And I was the chauffeur. I was his driver, everything. And we could find the humility of Sheikh Ahmad Didad. He stayed in my house, in our house. He slept on the floor. And I told him, Uncle, why are you so aggressive? He told me, Son, I'm not aggressive, I'm militant. He said, I'm a Pathan. And there are only two ways you can fight the devil. One is with holy water and the second is with fire. I chose the fire. He did not rebuke me. He told me, my son, I'm not aggressive, I'm militant. I'm a Mujahid. And you can fight the devil with holy water or fire. I chose the fire. If somebody can fight with holy water, he's most welcome. I'm finding success in the fire, so I'm doing it. And that was the turning point in my life. Only on Sheikh Ahmed Dida that I can speak for maybe five to ten hours. Time will not permit us. Then when he went back, he invited me. I went to South Africa. I stayed at his home. Then he told me, why don't you attend the International Dawah Training Program to be held in the end of 1988? We have got thousands of applications. I think he had about 40 seats. But I was doing my medical college second year. I could not take a leave of two months. So I had to apologize. I came back to Bombay and my life changed. I started doing Dawah. I almost memorized all the lectures of Sheikh Didad. Almost all. He had given me a set of more than 50 video cassettes. That time he had 50 sets. And I started my Dawah in Bombay. And I realized that when I spoke with non-Muslims, I never stammered. Miracle. When I did Dawah with the non-Muslims, with the Christian missionaries, with the Hindu pundits, I never stammered. The moment I come back and speak with any Muslim, same stammering. Ajib. I said, what is this? The moment I start with the non-Muslim, no stammering. I come back home, I speak to my sister, I start stammering. I speak to my friends, I start stammering. I said, Alhamdulillah, at least while doing dawah, I don't stammer. And I started doing dawah, going to church, one-to-one -one dawah with priests, with pandits. And from 1988 to 91, Alhamdulillah, that became the major mission. So much so that I even did dawah in my Bombay Medical College, Nair Hospital, Topiwala National Medical College. And the Muslims were very few, hardly about 3%. In population, we are 14.5%, according to statistics, actually more than 20%. But in the medical college, we were only 3%. So when I used to do dawah, all my Muslim friends would run away. Saying, Zakir to be marwaenga. Zakir will now have us killed. So when I asked to start doing dawah with the Hindus, my Muslim friend used to run away. So I asked to be alone in the battlefield. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Never ever did any non-Muslim even catch my collar while I did dawah. Till today, mashallah. I even started doing dawah with my professors and my teachers. So my Muslim friend used to say that in a medical college, there is a separate examination called as viva vos, which is orals. So besides passing in theory, you also have to pass in orals, viva vos. So my friend said, you are doing dawah with your professors, they will fail you. And to fail in viva is very easy, there is no record. At least written paper, you can do re-examination and you can repass, correct? But viva vos, there is no re-examination. And you have to pass separately 50% in viva and 50% in written exams. So my friend used to tell me that you are doing dawah with your professors. Hindu professors, they'll fail you. I have to tell them, if they fail me, maybe Allah wants me to do one, one more year dawah with them. I was an optimist. 
I never said, oh, if they fail me, why should I? I said, if Allah wants me to do, if Allah fails me, maybe Allah wants me to do one more dawah with them. And alhamdulillah, I continued my dawah. And we used to print, because my father had many organizations. So, alhamdulillah, my father funded the complete tour of Sheikh Ahmad Didan. That was on his own. Allah had given him the capacity. So, I told my father, why don't we print Sheikh Ahmad Didan's book and distribute it free? So, we printed, he had about 17 books, some 10,000, some 15,000, 20,000 capacity. And we gave ads in the newspaper and started distributing Sheikh Didat's book free. Then we thought, why don't we make a library for distributing Sheikh Didat's video cassettes to the public? And I told my father, why don't you give me some space? We have got so much property. So he gave me a small office of 250 square feet, less than 25 meters. And I told him, I require 5,000 rupees every month from you. You are donating so much outside. Why don't you give me 25,000? Why don't you give me 5,000 rupees a month? In today's, it would be about 67 US dollars. At that time, today the dollar rate is 75 rupees to a dollar. That time it was 23 rupees. So at that time, it was about 218 US dollars a month. I told my father, you are spending so much money giving charity. Why don't you give me 5,000 rupees, 218 dollars? That is less than a thousand ringgit to me. Nowadays it will be maybe less than 300 ringgit. That time it was 1,000 ringgit. And my father told me, you want to start a religious organization? People will pull your leg, will pull you down. But you want to go ahead? You want to try? I will support you. So he agreed with that. So we started a new organization. And what name should we give? We had the option of giving the same name as the organization of Sheikh Ahmed Didad, Islamic Propagation Center International. But we thought giving the name propagation in a Hindu majority country will not be hikma. So we chose the name Islamic Research Foundation. And we started the organization in a small place of less than 25 square meter with a budget of 5,000 rupees. In today's time, $67. At that time, $218 a month. It was maybe one of the smallest organizations. And we started it. And what we did initially, I had one friend of mine who was also a medical doctor in the Unani field. Dr. Shweb Sayyid, he was quite popular in speaking amongst the Christian missionaries. So I thought, okay, he's our orator. We will create a platform for other people to speak. Because I was a stammerer. How could I speak? I couldn't have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. So what we used to do, we used to call students from engineering college and other colleges in groups of 25, 30, and we used to show them clippings of different speakers from the world. And I had a hobby of collecting all video cassettes of Islamic speakers, maybe for about half an hour to one hour. And then we had open question answer session. So the first program we had in the office, when we showed the video cassette, I told my friend, Dr. Shoeb, you are a speaker, go and handle the question answer session. He went, the first time he got cold feet. What to do? People are waiting. I took the courage and I went. I took his place. And I realized that on the stage, I don't stammer. It was a miracle. On the stage when I started speaking, I did not stammer. When I came down from the stage, again I'm stammering. Normally, the best of speakers when they come on the stage, they stammer. So to stammer is common on the stage, but me, being an extreme stammerer, on the stage, I never stammered. And that's how I first time appeared in public in front of 25 people, handling the question-answer session. 
and I realized that it clicked. They asked me questions, I started giving answers, and I was very good in debating and arguing. In the school and college days, I was known for my logic and for argumentative skill. So much so that if they said proof black to be white, I could prove black to be white. I could prove day to be night. I was expert in arguing. Now I'm using this skill to present Islam to present the Haq. This was a change in my life. And I had a hobby and a passion to meet the various Islamic speakers of the world. And if I only talk on that, it will be tens of us. I'll just speak about the experience of the second speaker or second personality who had a great impact on my life. And that was Dr. Israr Ahmed. Dr. Israr Ahmed, may Allah grant him Jannah. He was one of the best Urdu speaking orators in the world that I know of. So I traveled all the way to Pakistan in 1991 to meet Dr. Isra Ahmed. He was a medical doctor. He wasn't trained in any Islamic institute or Islamic university. He was a medical doctor inspired by Maududi, Jamaat Islami, went to Tabli Jamaat, then started his own organization, Tanzim Islam. I went to Lahore to meet him. And I was shocked at his simplicity. The command that he has over the Quran, he also speaks in English but mainly in Urdu. And I was impressed by it. So I purchased all his video cassettes and added to the video cassette library. And to cut the story short, I learned many things from him. I'll just mention two important things I learned. Number one, he told me that I told about my background, I'm a medical doctor, I've just passed. And in 1991, I finished my medical studies and I was doing my internship when we started the organization. In 1991, in 1990, I finished my medical studies. For one year, there was internship. And during internship, I had more time, so we started the organization. So I told him, I've just finished my medical studies. I would like to do, I would like to become a surgeon, do my MS, and I'm interested in Dawa. So he told me, son, you have to choose between the two. Either you choose your medical practice or Dawa. I being a medical doctor, I practiced for seven years and tried to do both. I could not. If you want to specialize, choose between the two, one thing. Then, after his guidance, I chose to become a Dai. The second thing I learned from him was, he told me that if you want to become a Dai, see to it that you make your personal needs the minimum. I said, why? He said, if you make your personal need the minimum, with the least amount of monthly requirement, you can speak the truth more easily. You won't have to depend on anyone. You won't have to depend on please someone who's paying your salary. See to it that your needs are the least. And I saw that he had such a big institution, but what a simple man, Dr. Israr Ahmed. May Allah grant him Jannah. And this thing that not to spend excessively was one of the cornerstone of my success. Just in case I forget, towards the end I may tell you, but today I require only 2,000 ringgit a month for me and my wife to survive. Only 2,000 ringgit. Very comfortably. Very comfortably, not for my DAW activity. DAW activity, though I have travel, fly, I pay my own money, that's different. That may be in large amount, but for my personal needs, 2,000 ringgit is sufficient. In Bombay, it was 40,000 rupees. Here is 2,000 ringgit, sufficient. Inshallah, time permits, I'll come to it later on. So these two things I learned from Sheikh Ahmed Didan. And 
when I came back, I told my parents. Initially, when we started the organization, Islam Research Foundation, I told my parents, I will only be giving two hours a week. Because once I finish my internship, when I join the MS surgery, I have to be the 24 by 6 or 6 and a half. Maybe I get half a day in a week free. So I spend some time with my family and two hours in this organization. But then I decided I will not do my post-graduation. I told my parents, I want to give two hours a day for dawah and the balance time for my medical practice. My father had a roaring practice. My elder brother, Dr. Muhammad Naik, also was a doctor. And my brother, he was a very good orator. So when Sheikh Ahmed Didat came, he was the MC because he was the secretary general of his medical college. Very good orator, not an Islamic speaker, but a general orator. So that's how Sheikh Didat was impressed. So I told my parents, two hours dawa, remaining medical practice. After a couple of months, I said 50% dawa, 50% medical practice. They said, no problem. Then I said, two hours medical practice, remaining dawa, they said, no problem. Then after a, maybe a year or so, I said, full-time dawa, they said, no problem. I was involved in the setting up of the diagnostic center, which was very lucrative. It was 50% partner, myself and my brother. My brother told me, don't worry about this. I will take care of it. You do your dawa, I will give you a 50% share. I said, I don't require 50%. He said, no, no, I will give you 50%. It is your thing. You do your dawah. So, inshallah, my brother, Dr. Muhammad, will get more sawab than me. He said, go ahead. So, in the initial stages of dawah, I had no problem whatsoever about funding. I asked my father to give me 5,000 rupees a month. It became 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 a month. I never asked any money. Nine, more than 95% of the funding of the dawah for the first several years was by my father. Never had any problems. And the first talk I gave was in 1992 in December. And as you are aware, Sheikh Ahmed Dida didn't carry notes. Sometimes he had carried some slips but generally without notes. So the first talk I gave in my life was, is the Quran God's word in the office, small office. Could accommodate about 50, 60 people. And I memorized, I wanted to give a one hour talk. So I memorized, first time in my life. And I gave the talk. The talk went on for approximately three hours. I was inexperienced, without notes. I spoke for three hours talking about the scientific miracles, about various research I did. Is the Quran God's word? It was little less than three hours. A marathon lecture, I thought it would be one hour. That was the first lecture of my life. It was in, you know, just an audience of 50 people. And then it started. Then we started having in public halls. For a few hundred then few thousand, then the numbers kept on increasing. And I had that philosophy at that time that a person should get married at the age of 25, best age, latest 27. So at the age of 25, I started finding a life partner. I could not find any. My only two criteria was she should be a dai and she should know English. I wasn't interested in beauty, wasn't interested in wealth, wasn't interested in nobility, only virtue. She should be virtuous, a dai, and knows English. So in the whole city of Bombay, I could not find anyone. Then one of the family friends told me that there is a girl in Pune, which is the city 160 kilometers from Bombay. So me, my mother, and my wife, without telling that girl, without telling her, we just visited the house, you know, without telling her, to try and find out what is she. And we went there and the mother welcomed and, and we were not knowing why we came there. We started asking about the love activities. At that time, I thought I was doing something wrong. 
hidingly going to see a girl. I thought it was wrong. I thought it was a minor sin. But now we realize that a prophet said it's a sunnah to go and look at the girl they're going to marry. And there were sahabas who saw the girl they're going to marry hidingly. So it's permitted in Islam. That time I thought it was, you know, maybe wrong. It's unethical. And, mashallah, when we came to know about her, I was impressed. Never ever did I see any girl. This is the first girl, because my sister used to first do the interview. We don't want to unnecessarily meet girls to marry. This is the first girl I met, and I was impressed. And she did not know about it. So therefore I joke with my wife that, you know, I started loving you before you started loving me. And I tell her that I'm ahead of you in love. In other things, okay, in taqwa, in Islam, she may be higher than me. But as far as love is concerned, I love you more than what you love me. She says, no, she loves me more than me. So I said, we will do the hisab kitab in akhirah, inshallah. So, mashallah, my wife, she was the president of the Girls Islamic Organization of Pune. And she used to give talks in Urdu. She was fluent in English. She was a lecturer in the college. And I said, yes, this is the girl I want. Virtuous, mashallah, taqwa. And we got married. People told, okay, now that you got married, now you'll give less time for dawah. Previously, I used to give about nine hours a day, ten hours a day. When I got married, I started giving 12 to 13 hours. When diagram, she came, we started a ladies' organization. First, Islam Research Foundation didn't have a ladies' wing. I got married on the 16th of May, 1993. A very simple marriage <coughs> in a mosque. At that time, it was well known that people give big receptions. And my father being well off and very well known, I made it a point and my wife too wanted a very simple nikah. So we only had a nikah in a mosque and we only gave dates that also dried dates it was a very simple marriage because the beloved prophet said make nikah simple so that zina would become difficult and the best marriage is that in which the least expense is made so we had a very simple nikah and mashallah there were more than 2000 people for my nikah not because of me, because of my father. The only thing we spent was, you know, sending invitations. And mashallah, more than 2,000 in a mosque, it was unheard of. For a nikah, unheard. In 1993. And then we had a walima. Very simple. We only called 19 people, direct brothers, sisters of mine, and brothers, sisters, and their spouses from my wife's side. Only 19 people. And we called 50 people from the orphanage. But the Prophet said, in the Walima, there should be poor people. So 50 people from the orphanage, 19 relatives of me and my wife, we hardly spend 3,000 rupees on the Walima. That's it. 3,000 rupees would be 1,800 ringgit. So to give an example, and when my wife's relatives came, we we kept them in my relative's home. We put beddings on the floor. We could have booked the best of five-star hotels. We could afford it. But we wanted to make the marriage very simple. So much so that we saved the money, what we can spend on the marriage, and we bought a new office for the organization. And that was the foundation. And it grew, mashallah. So what we could spend millions of ringgit, on the wedding which normally is done compared to the status that we had we spend that money in buying an office I said I don't want a house for myself I want office for the DAO organization and that was an investment and this organization Islamic Research Foundation it grew mashallah and we'll come to it later on then mashallah on the 10th of July about one year two and a half months later after the marriage on 10th of July 1996 
my son Farik was born and we asked an Arabic scholar I want a name which is like a die, unique name so he gave the name Farik Farik means to differ between the Haq and Batil the truth again falsehood a unique name same like Farouk and after Farik was born he was hardly two and a half months and we went to meet Sheikh Ahmad Didad in 1994 we went to meet Sheikh Ahmad Didad and Farik was two and a half months old and you could have we have the photograph of Sheikh Didat carrying my son Farik and he blessed him and we can see the results of his dua at that time I gave my first lecture abroad in South Africa in the Grey Street Durban Mosque it was it was the largest mosque of South Africa and the person sitting in front of me was Sheikh Ahmad Didad. And I was nervous that Sheikh Ahmad Didad listening to my talk. And after that talk, he gave me a certificate calling me Didat Plus in 1994. And I said, surely this man is great. He wants to encourage me. Therefore, he called me. Oh, I was nothing. And then I asked his son, that has your father given this title to anyone else? He said, no, you're the only person. I thought maybe, you know, to encourage youngsters, people try and give. He said, no. I said, what did Sheikh Didat see in me that he gave me this title? And in the Great Street Mosque, there were more than a thousand people there. Maybe a few thousand people, mashallah, for the Juma Salah. And he told me, son, you are coming from India, you have large audiences. When you go to Saudi Arabia, Gulf countries, expect only five or ten people. Maybe in the mosque, maybe in the university. Don't expect hundreds and thousands of people like you have in India. So expect only five people, ten people, and then slowly, slowly, inshallah, later on you may get popularity. So when I went to give my first talk after Durban in 1996, in the beginning of 1996, the first talk I gave in Jeddah, I was expecting about 10 to 15 people. And mashallah, for the first talk in Jeddah, there were more than a thousand people. I was shocked. Then I realized some people had copied my video cassette and they distributed it. I had hardly given three, four lectures. It became viral. And Saudi Arabia is the hub. People from all over the world come to work there. From USA, from Canada, from UK, from Malaysia. You have from Australia, all over the world people come and work there. So from there, it became viral throughout the world and I started receiving invitations from throughout the world. That was how I started my international talks. And in 1996, while I was doing my Hajj with my wife, we were supposed to go to Masjid Aqsa after Hajj, I received the information that Sheikh Ahmed Didat, Rahimullah, may Allah grant him Jannah, Jannah Fidos, he received a stroke and he was paralyzed. I immediately cancelled my trip. I told my wife, go back to Bombay. I went to the South African embassy, stamped a visa, and I was the first person from abroad to visit Sheikh Ahmed Didat when he got the stroke and he was hospitalized. Then his son requested me, his name is Yusuf Didat, that my father is supposed to give a series of talk in Cape Town, can you replace him? I said, ah, how can I give in place of your father? He said, no, the program is organized, people will come. And I went to Cape Town and I gave the talks on behalf of Sheikh Ahmed Didat in 1996. And then later on I kept visiting him a few times. And I remember in 2020 when I went and Sheikh Ahmed Didat's favorite pastime after he got the stroke was watching my video cassettes. So when I went to meet him again in 2020, when he saw me try to cry and we used to communicate via the eyes, you know, because the person who's in coma who cannot move around, who had hemiplegia, 
There is a method of communication. There is a chart. Line number one, A, B, C, D, E. Line number two, F, G, H, I, J. Line number three, it goes on. So if you want to communicate, if you have to say I, one, two, he blinks. So second line, F, G, H, I, blink. So every letter you can spell by blinking your eye. So I was communicating with me. He said, I want to give you a message. And he gave that message to me. And that message, it took time. And his son was there. He said, son, my son, what you have achieved in four years had taken me 40 years to achieve, alhamdulillah. And then his son took a plaque and he printed this with his thumbprint in 2020 May. Son, what you have achieved in four years had taken me 40 years to achieve, alhamdulillah. And that was the biggest award that I got in my life. Sheikh Ahmed Didad himself, when he was sick, he gave that award to me. He, he blinked with the blinking of his eyes, he communicated with the thumb impression. Son, what you achieved in four years had taken me 40 years to achieve. And this was because, if you remember, I had asked him, Uncle, why are you so aggressive? He said, I'm militant. You can fight the devil in two ways, with holy water or with fire. And when I met Sheikh Didat in the initial part of my dawah, I was multiple times more aggressive, multiple times more militant than Sheikh Didat. Because young blood, now also I'm young, mashallah. But that time I was younger. And I did dawah with my students, with my classmates, with my teachers. I got results, but I wasn't happy with it. I said, same matter of Sheikh Didat. Sheikh Didat is X amount militant, I'm 10X. Why results so less? Then I changed. Then I became soft. But when I became soft, they knew, oh, this is a lion. A lion need not roar. The king of the jungle need not roar. So I had a mixture. I could be more militant than Didat. I could be as soft as Sheikh M, like, uh, like Dr. Jamal Badwi. You know, so I, I had a different style, being humble, when required in debate, be militant. So I gave him one of my lectures on similarities between Islam and Hinduism. And there, you know, some of the Hindus who are belonging to some hardcore fanatic organization, they come and attack you. They're cursing me and I'm smiling. I'm the India brother and Sheikh Dida said, my son, how can you smile when they're cursing you? So I told him, you fought the devil with fire, I'm fighting with holy water. At that time, he gave me this plaque. Son, what you have achieved in four years had taken me 40 years to achieve. So then I developed a style. You should be as militant as Sheikh Didat, more militant, be soft, be humble, be logical. So I saw many speakers all over the world. Time will not permit me to speak about them. Variety of speakers. We had the largest video cassette library in the world at that time. About four or five thousand. And I used to see various speakers, logic, reason, did my own study. It was a variety. And Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Didad was the person who changed me from a doctor of a body to doctor of a soul. And Dr. Isar Ahmed inspired me to leave my profession. So these two people were the main people who were the inspiration. And in the end of 1996, on the 4th of November 1996, my second child, my elder daughter, Zikra, she was born. And after she was born, next month, it was my first talk, because in Bombay, the auditorium were limited. The biggest auditorium in Bombay had 3,000 capacity. So the audience started increasing. We hired a hall of 2,000, 4,000 people came, sitting outside. So then we decided from now onward, we will not have lectures in the hall. We will have in open grounds. So it was the first lecture of mine in the open ground in the same institute which Sheikh Didat gave. Sheikh Didat gave in the auditorium in Sabu Siddiq. 
I gave in the Sabu Sid the ground, and we had put 6,000 seats, and mashallah, it was packed. So the first public lecture in open ground was in December 1996. And I remember from there, I went to Singapore, and then I came to Malaysia. The first time I came to Malaysia on the invitation, I think the name of the person was Iskandar, Abdullah Iskandar. He called me. And we started receiving invitations from different parts of the world. And I said, let's travel. So I did not know this person. I came here. And then I gave talk in Abim. I went here. I went to Kuala Lumpur and different parts. I think it was in Penang. And that was my first trip to Malaysia. And I was impressed with Malaysia. Then I came back in 1998, then 2000, 2001, 2004, and I kept on coming regularly. We'll come to it later on. Now when Sheikh Ahmed Didar got the stroke, he continued doing his dawah from the bed, but I had seen all his videos, and most of it I memorized. Now what to do? Then I started doing an introspection of myself. And I realized that I have got three major drawbacks. Number one, I have not gone to any Islamic university. No Islamic school, no Islamic college, no Islamic university, but I'm giving talks. Thousands are coming, ten thousands are coming. I don't know Arabic as a language, number two. I'm not Hafizul Quran. Many people think I'm Hafizul Quran, I'm not. So I decided that inshallah, all my children, I will see to it that they pass from an Islamic international university. I'll see to it that they learn Arabic Loga Fusa as a language. I'll see to it that all are Hafizul Quran. That was my aim. And I said, okay, fine. I should learn Arabic as a language. Now I'm already, no, I cannot go back to institute now. So I went to Makkah, and one of the Loga department teacher, Moran Nadvi, I spent one month with him, learned a little bit. Then I said, I want to learn under the best teacher in the world. Then when I did my research, I came to know the best teacher to teach Arabic to a non-Arab was Dr. Fa Abdurrahim who was the head of the Loga Department of Islamic University of Medina. I did not know him. So in 1997, I went to meet him. People told, impossible. He's so popular. He doesn't, he teaches PhD student. Why will he give you time? Head of the Department of Medina University. I said, what's the harm in trying? So I took an appointment and I went to meet him. And I said, you know, I'm so-and-so person, I'm inspired by these, I'm listening, listening. He said, people told me you are the best teacher, so can you give some time, is it possible? So he smiled. He said, Dr. Zakir, do you know you gave a lecture in Medina a few months back? I said, yes. I was sitting on the first row. I said, really? I do not know. And I'm impressed with your talk. What do you want? I said, I want you to give me a few hours a day. And I want you to tell me how much time will I take? He said, according to me, you give me five months, I will give you five hours a day. Five hours a day, one to one. I was like, Hadam in Fazli Rabbi, the best teacher in the world, the best scholar. And when I sat with him, he was an ocean of knowledge. He knew more than 17, 18 languages. German, and so I went to Medina. And I said I will stay there for five, six months. And immediately after Dohar, after lunch, up to Maghrib time. It was about five and a half hours. Mine is the time of Asar time, in between half an hour. Five hours every day. But I had my nature of asking questions. So more than learning, I had to ask him questions. And because in my field of Dawa, I had been to so many anti-Islamic sites. There are grammatical errors in the Quran. And this person was a true scholar. Originally Indian, from Chennai. Then did his master's or PhD in al -Adhar. Then started the Loga department in Medina University. And his knowledge was par excellence. 
I learned many things from him. So instead of learning Arabic, I was more interested, you know, do this, do that. What is this? You know, oh, that, you know, this person, 30 grammatical errors. And he used to tell me how to answer. I thought, okay, six months are there. Let me finish in the first two, three weeks about my question. Then there is time for me. He had three books. Book one, book two, book three. I learned a lot. And from him I learned. He used to tell me that I am a Muslim. I am not Hanafi. I am not Shafi. I am not Hanbali. I am not Maliki. I am not Salafi. I am a Muslim. Allah says in the Quran, Qala inna nimna al-Muslim. And that stuck to my mind. He told Allah never says in the Quran, you are a Hanafi, you are a Shafi, you are a Hanbali, you are a Maliki, you are a Salafi. And he used to laugh. And the command he had, he was my first official teacher. There were other teachers of deen. And whatever I learned from him became as though I wouldn't have gained even if I had done PhD. Because that became my weapon. That became, you know, power for me. Because when I spoke with other scholars, when I gave, they didn't know. They were scholars of tafsir, of hadith, but they didn't know Luga. I spoke with Arabs, they did not know the answer. And what he told me, being original Indian, because he was an expert. Allah says in the Quran, Fas'alu ahli zikri in kuntul atalamun. If you don't know, ask the person who knows. Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 43 and Surah Ambiya chapter number 21 verse number 7. So he was an ocean of wealth. Then I met my second great teacher, that is Sheikh Dr. Ziaraman Asmi, who was also an Indian. Dr. Fahab Dirim used to stay with him on the ground floor, he used to stay on the first floor. And being an Indian, even he knew me. So I told Sheikh Ziyar Rahman Admin, he was the head of the Medina University, Dean of the Arabic, uh, Dean of the Hadith Department. Now to speak on Fahab Dirim, I can speak for two hours. To speak about Sheikh Ziyar Rahman Admin, he was a scholar of Hadith, I can speak for us together. To cut it short, he agreed to give me four hours twice a week. And my basic of Hadith was with Dr. Ziyar Rahman Asmi. He was Hindu, he was a Brahmin, became Dean, and then he compiled the Jame Kamil. Jame Kamil is one of the unique work, all the Sai Hadith are together. I can speak an hour on Jame Kamil, just to cut it short. There is no compilation of all the Hadith together. Sai Bukhari, Sahih, but all Hadith aren't there. What he did, because I asked to question him, Doctor, we talk about Quran Hadith, where is the Hadith? Okay, Almani did Sai Bukhari Muslim, Sai Abu Dawood, Sai Nasai, Sai Tirmidhi, but all the hadith are not there. He said, yes. So he couldn't answer to me. But after he retired, his mission became to compile all the Sai hadith and mashallah, all my support and duas were there. And he was able to complete in about 18 to 20 years. He compiled all the Sai hadith and removed the duplicate 16,546 hadith. Then we have a summarized version. We are doing the translation. Inshallah, the English version would be completed in a couple of months and the print would be out by the end of this year. Time doesn't permit me to speak about that, but my basic of hadith knowledge came from Dr. Zayra Manasmi. Unfortunately, after about three and a half weeks, less than a month, I got a call from Bombay that I had to go back to Bombay immediately. So that I could not complete my, my Arabic language course. Did finish two books with him, but the third book was the Voluminous. I went back and then got involved in other activities. So these two were the initial two teachers in my life. And after that, I met Alhamdulillah. As my passion was to meet the top scholars of the world. And to cut it short, I met Sheikh bin Baz, Raimullah, in the year 1998. At that time, the three top scholars, at that time, Sheikh bin Baz, Sheikh Nasir al-Albani, and Sheikh Otaimi. So my passion, I met Sheikh bin Baz, I couldn't meet then his secretary, Sheikh Lukman Salfi. 
He knew me. Then he introduced me. We had a one-to-one -one meeting for hours together. And his advice is, mashallah, time would permit me. And Sheikh Bin Baz expired on the 13th of May, 1999. Maybe a few months or a year after I met him. And Sheikh Nasir Albani, he expired on the 2nd of October, 1999, the same year, after a few months. I said, oh, two great scholars gone together. Now the third one remaining is Sheikh Utaimi. So I have to go to Saudi Arabia in a year, twice or thrice. Average three times, sometimes four times, five times, I had an Akama. Right from 1997, or more than 20 years, 21 years I had Akama. So in, in, in the year 99, I wanted to meet Sheikh Utaimi. He was not in town. In, 20, 20, in, in the year 2000, in 1999, a lot of time in the year 2000, I went. He was sick in the hospital. And unfortunately, in January 2001, on the 10th of January, Sheikh Utaimi, may Allah grant him Jannah, even he expired. It was my bad luck, I could not meet him. The next best caller of that time living was Sheikh Abdullah ibn Jibreen. I thought I should not miss him. So I met Sheikh Abdullah ibn Jibreen, great scholar. And from right from 2005, 6, 7, 8, multiple times I met him. He was a great source of knowledge. At that time, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Jibreen was one of the best living scholars. And if I had any difficulty, any fatwa, and I used to communicate with him through one of my friends, Sheikh Jaman Zahrani, who was a pilot, and he was a great dai, mashallah. And even now he's alive. So he was my main communication with all the scholars. And Sheikh Abdullah ibn Jibreen gave a fatwa about peace TV. I'll come to it later on. That peace TV, you can use zakat money for jihad. And the best jihad is the jihad with the media. And he gave a fatwa that you can give zakat to peace TV in 2006. I think seven. And... Every year we used to meet him a few times, mashallah, and spend a lot of time with him. And may Allah grant him Jannah, he expired in 2009, that July, Sheikh Abdul Jibreen. This is just to give you a brief time, it's running short. I had a passion of meeting scholars, whether it be Salafi, whether it be Hanafi, and the best Indian scholar at that time was Maulana Ali Mianadwi. He was the most renowned Islamic scholar of India, all over the world, including Gulf country. He was known for his books on literature. He was the person who was given the second award. The second person who got the King Faisal Award after Maududi was Maulana Ali Mianadri. And he also got the first award of the Dubai Holy Quran International Award. He was the only Indian at that time to receive both these awards. There was no Indian who received both these awards. There was no Indian who received King Faisal Award. He was the only one. There was no Indian who received the Dubai Holy Quran Award, which was the second award. He was the only Indian. And he was well known. And he was close to my father. We met many times. We discussed. I learned a lot from him. I met Maulana Abdul Karim Parekh. He was another Hanafi Maulana. And I was the closest to him, very close to him. And had a lot of experience. Then the other person I remember was Qazi Mujahidul Islam. MashaAllah. Excellent in mantik, in logic. He was a judge. He was a jurist. MashaAllah. Kazi Mujahidul Kasmi. These are great names from India. Then I met Salim Kasmi, who was head of Deoband. So in, because I did not go to any particular madrasa, my mind was in, you know, blocked. I met Hanafi scholars, Deobandi, Nadwi, Salafi, and I was broad-minded. MashaAllah. And I used to meet any scholar, but, mashallah, the main guideline was Quran and Sunnah. Time is running short. Then, in the year 1999, on the 26th of February, my third child was born, my second daughter, that is Rushda. And I told my wife, that a beloved prophet said, if you bring two daughters with love and affection till they mature, inshallah, you will be in Jannah close to the prophet. So I said, good. 
after Rujda was born, inshallah, maybe they will be a Jannah. And all these names that you find, Zikra was again given by another Arabic scholar. Rujda was given by Dr. Fahab Darim. I said, I want a name which is a Dai name, a unique name, a name for Dawa. So Farik is Farq between Haq and Batil. Zikra is same like Zakir, a lady who does Zikr. Rujda is one who gives guidance. And Alhamdulillah, all these words had an impact on my children. And MashaAllah, we started a school. My son was admitted in the same school where I was, St. Peter's High School, a Christian missionary school. But we wanted to, it was my desire to make an institution which is education for both the worlds. And we started the Islamic International School. And whoever I met, they said it is impossible. How can you have Deen and Dunya together in the same school? Impossible. And I met many scholars, all of them 100%. They said not possible except for Dr. Fahab Darim. Dr. Fahab Darim said it is very difficult, but it's possible. And we started the Islamic International School. I've given the talk of about three and a half hours on that. Time will not permit me to speak about it. Our main basic was when a person passes from that school, he should be better than an average person passing from madrasa, who's an alim. And he should be better than a person who does his A-level from Cambridge. So we had a school recognized, you know, a school with the certificate came from Cambridge A-level, recognized, it's the most recognized system in the world. And we taught Arabic from the age of nursery, three years, two and a half years. And we had graduates from Medina University teaching. They said, Zakir, how can we teach Arabic? I said, if Allah helps you, can you do it or not? So my, my, key, my master key was, if Allah is with you, can you do it or not? And that way, mashallah, we started, we taught Arabic from the age of three. We did hifz of the Quran. One third of the people were hafiz. They could quote Quran, chapter number, verse number. We had fiqh, hadith in English and Arabic. And my intention was that 50 person who passed from the school, they would go in the mainstream, become doctors, engineers, lawyers, you know, but Muslim, man, Muslim practicing lawyers, engineers, doctors. And 50% dais, teachers, etc. The first batch of students, there were about 14 boys and girls, I don't remember. From 14 boys, half of them went to the mainstream, seven of them, we got them admitted to Imam Muhammad, Imam Muhammad University, Imam Muhammad bin Saud University. And according to me, the best Islamic university in the world, according to me, you know, the more famous is the Medina University, Islamic University of Medina. But according to me, because Islamic University of Medina, 50% of the students are foreigners, 50% are Saudi. Imam Muhammad bin Saud, less than 1% are foreigners. So non-Saudi can't get admission, very difficult. But Alhamdulillah, Allah's help was there. I approached the dean, he knew me. He gave admission to all seven without examination, all seven. So all seven students, mashallah, went, and my son, mashallah, last year, in December, sorry, year before last, in 2020, December, he passed from Imam Muhammad bin Saud, from the Sharia field, mashallah. And now he's doing his masters in the IIUM. I said that, you know, graduation is fine, but main is practical dawa. With me, maybe he will do more dawa than. So I told him not to continue in Saudi. Now he's taking admission into Islamic University of Medina. Sorry, Islamic University of Malaysia, IIUM. And he's doing his master's in fiqh and usul fiqh. My daughters, they passed recently from the Princess Noura University. They finished the bachelor's in Islamic studies. All three of them are Marshal Hafiz al Quran. But among the three, my youngest daughter, Rushda, she is phenomenal. Her hips is phenomenal. Anytime she can decide, one day she stood, she started from Fajr after Fajr, by Asar or Maghrib, she finished the full Quran without any mistakes, mashallah. So Allah has given her the power of hips, mashallah. And she stammers, not like as much as me, but she does stammer. So each child of mine has their own speciality. Farik is more well versed with giving public lectures. Zikra is good with the Qirat. She has more passion and love. So all three of them have their own qualities. All three of them, them they know Loka Fosa very well. 
the Hafiz al Quran, all of them are bachelors from Islamic University, all of them intend doing the master's and PhD, inshallah. So we started the school, and that was one of my projects of life. Then, my second project of life was to have an Islamic satellite channel. And we saw the other channels and we started Peach TV, mashallah, in January 2006. We launched Peach TV English in January 2006. Time is short, I'll just rush through. Urdu channel we launched in 2009. 2011 we launched the Peach TV Bangla and Peach TV Chinese Mandarin in 2015. Each one has a story, each channel I can speak for a few hours. Time will not permit me. Alhamdulillah, we became the largest religious network in the world, having a viewership of 200 million people, mashallah. 200 million viewers. We covered the full globe. In 2016, only Peach TV English had more than 100 million viewers. Peach TV Urdu had more than 80 million viewers. Peach TV Bangla had more than 50 million viewers. And Peach TV Chinese had more than 20 million viewers. And it was the first high definition religious channel in the world even earlier than the christian missionary channels in july 2009 we launched the first hd religious channel and now all four hd mashallah i had a dream that we should have the best equipment in the world for islam and we did that we had the best of cameras people said this person is rough. i said this you know allah had blessed us I can own even Rolls Royce, but my Rolls Royce was my camera. Each camera costing more than a million ringgit. One camera, more than a million ringgit. We had 18 cameras, mashallah. So this was my Rolls Royce. But in 2005, I changed my policy. I said, no, I don't want to have the best equipment for, for video broadcast, no. I said, I want to have the best equipment for film telecast. So in 2005, we went to Japan, we went to Sony, and we said, we want to buy cameras. 15, I said, crazy, 15 cameras, film cameras, I mean, where are you coming from? So Sony, Japan was shocked. Normally, film camera, film the shot with one camera. If there's a fight sequence, three camera, four camera, why do you own 15 cameras? Maybe you understand. Or, or do you have more money? I said, no, no, no. My logic is that if you shoot with the best bro best video cameras today, it can be in the world for maximum four or five years. After four years, it will get obsolete. That is the reason Sheikh Didar used the best cameras, but what he shot in 2000, the last lecture he gave, 1996, in the year 2000, became obsolete. So when I want to telecast Sheikh Didar on my Peach TV, only to upgrade 200 hours, I spent more than a million dollars, and then I write on my channel, poor quality, sorry. Didar used the best cameras of his time. So in 2015, I changed my policy. I will not use the best ca cameras for video. I will use the best camera in the world for film and show it on video. I said, what's the logic? I said, the logic is, if I shoot a scholar, I can have his video telecast for next 50 years. Now, Sheikh Didad, I cannot show on PC. I'm showing, but with poor quality. If, I, if we had used film cameras for Sheikh Didad, even today it would have been 8K. So we bought 4K cameras, 8K cameras, and it was on the Sony website. There is no production house in the world which owned the cameras which we owned. We believed in quality. And the cost was only a small percentage. Why? Because there's a cost for labor, there's a cost for telecast. The equipment cost is there, but if I divide it, I'm spending only 5% more, and I'm securing the footage for the next 50 years. Allah gave us, mashallah, success, and we kept on growing. The other thing that I had in mind and my desire was to have a conference. When I used to see Grammy Awards, Oscar Award, what technology they have got, lighting, cameras, but majority haram. So why can't we use this technology for halal means? I'm running short of time. 
So why can't we use? Because lighting is not haram. Camera is not haram. Most of the things done on the camera is haram. That's different. But camera per se is not haram. Lighting is not haram. So when I asked to, I said, why can't we Muslim use these good stages? So I said, let me, Ya Allah, I pray to Allah. Let me at least do one conference with this good stage. So in 2007, what we did? I invested in some Islamic stocks. And in one year, I made more than a million dollar profit. And then we had this conference. The cost of the conference was, of course, four million dollars. And we did this conference. Phenomenal! With the best of cameras, lighting, stage. And people were shocked. We called 20 best English-speaking duats from all over the world. And including Sheikh Hussein, he was there. And you can ask him, most of the people who came from America, Yusuf Estes and all this, what is this? And when we showed them, it was all white cloth. What is this white, white? In the day, when they saw in the evening, it was lit up with multicolors, with the best, and they were shocked. And they gave interviews that never in our life we attended such a conference. And everything was free. It was telecast throughout the world. The software is yet there. Then we had the second conference in 2008 in Urdu. Then the third conference in 2009 in English. Then 2010, 2011. Every conference we had one imam from Haram. In the first conference we had Sheikh Muhammad Ayyub, who was from Imam of Medina Mosque of Masjid al -Nabbi. Second conference, we had Sheikh Salah Budair, again from Masjid al -Nabbi. Then we had Adil Kalbani, we had Sheikh Shuraim. Sheikh Sudesh was supposed to come, he couldn't come. Then Sheikh Shuraim came again the second time. And again, I can speak for maybe five, ten hours on the conferences. Allah blessed. It was a desire. We want to have it once. It became so good that when we showed people, they said, can we be part of it? Part of it means what? No, then we made a documentary. And the documentary became viral. So everyone started to say, can we be? I said, everything is free. So because of this, mashallah, we started receiving support phenomenal. And as I said, we started small. We started giving lectures in a small hall of mine, then went outside a few thousand. In three, four years, it became in Bombay, 6,000, then 10,000. Then the audience kept on increasing in Bombay. Then the audience in the conferences for my talk went up to 200,000. The largest gathering I gave was in Kishan in 2012, where there were more than a million people live. It was the largest gathering of any religious speaker in the world. It's a record, one million people live. And it is not, it is of a single speaker, and that's not hypothetical. It's not hypothetical. It was actual. And Alhamdulillah, Allah blessed. Hadha min fazli rabbi. Imagine I could not have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people in my dream. In my dream, I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor in the world, but I couldn't have dreamt of becoming, speaking in front of 25 people. And here Allah makes it possible. And Alhamdulillah, summa Alhamdulillah, in the full life of my dawah, we never charged a single penny for any of my dawah activity. In the first few years, it was mainly funded by my family. And we used to give a percentage, and Allah blessed. When I left my medical practice, I was yet 50% partner. I started doing my own business. I used to spend on average two days a month, a few hours a week maybe less than 24 days a year, and used to earn millions of dollars. Allah blessed. And whatever we used to earn, we used to see to it that we used to make Allah a bigger partner than us. So minimum we started initially was 51% of what we earned, we gave in charity. Then kept on increasing, I won't tell you, that's between me and Allah. But I tell people, that if you want to make Allah your partner, make him the major shareholder, not the minor shareholder. If Allah is the shareholder of your business, who will take care of your business? Allah. I tell everyone, I tell my staff, what, even if you earn a thousand ringgit, start with 10% in the way of Allah. Allah will make it 2,000, then give 15%, then give 20%. The more you give, the balance with you 
percentage will be less, but the amount will be more. And I'm the living example. We never use dawa even to earn a single penny, never ever. Even all the awards that we got, 100% what we got, we gave it for waqf. When Allah is giving us directly, why should we? Agreed, taking salary for dawa is not haram at all, it is jayas. Please don't get me wrong. But when Allah is giving you directly, why do you require to take a salary? We never had problems. The moment I kept on increasing the share of Allah, the balance with me kept on becoming more. But what I spent on myself was very less. I learned from Dr. Isar Ahmed. What you spend on yourself should be minimal. What you spend for dawa, do it. So whenever we traveled, it's a policy initially in the first few years. Yes, when the organizers used to call us, they used to give us a ticket. I used to say only economy. After a few years, first condition, if I come to give talk, I will pay for my ticket. I will pay for my hotel. Till now. If you pay for my ticket, I will not come. Except if it's a government invitation, if I'm called by Saudi Arabia, and I cannot argue with the king. But if it's any prince calling me, you know, once the brother of Prince Walid bin Talal, he called me. I said, I'll come. Okay, we'll book a ticket for you. I said, sorry, you cannot. We'll book the best five total. I said, sorry, you cannot. If you want me to come, I pay for my ticket, I pay for my hotel. Allah is giving us directly, so why should you? Those who can't afford, they take the ticket. Today, what do you have in the world? I will only come for the lecture if you give me a thousand US dollars. I'll only come for the lecture if you give two thousand dollars. What is this? Demanding money? As a salary, okay. But if you don't give money, you know, people offered me for one one lecture big amounts. I said, impossible. It's my condition that if you call me, you cannot charge any money unless it's a conference. My condition became, if you call me, you cannot charge money. If you have less money, I will pay you. So we never earned even a single penny. Even the tea that I had in my organization, being the president, I paid for that. It is allowed to have tea. But I didn't want Allah to say, okay, I have donated so much, now tea money is calculated. I could have said that. If we used any staff for any of my private work, I paid a salary. So many of my staff were paid by me personally because sometimes they used to work for me. I didn't want any of my sawab to be reduced. What people think, okay, you're doing dawa, Allah, will, Allah has blessed me a lot. Even if I'd been the best doctor, I wouldn't have won so much. Did investment in shares, did real estate, started a mobile, whatever we did, we got profit. I hardly spent less than two days in a month. And Allah blessed us. But the major shareholder of all my business is Allah. And Alhamdulillah, time is short, I'll just mention one more thing, that we got listed in, in India in 2009, there was the 100 most powerful men of India by one of the leading newspapers, Indian Express. In 2009, they listed me as 82nd most powerful. I don't know how they came to know. In 2009, 82nd, and in the spiritual gurus, I was number three. In 2010, all over India, I became 89th most powerful. There was no Muslim religious person in this list any time. Yes, there were some Muslim actors, you know, Shah Rukh Khan, Salman Khan, but no Muslim religious personality. Hindu, yes, many. In 2010, in the spiritual gurus, it was Ramdev Baba, number one in 2009, Shri Shri Ravi Shankar, two, I was third. In 2010, they became lower than me. I became first, so they didn't publish the list only. Allah blessed. In, in a Yugov research, they have the most, the person who's most popular. So in Pakistan in 2014, the Yugov list, I was the sixth most revered person in Pakistan. There was Bill Gates, Barack Obama, and the Prime Minister was number seven, Nawaz Sharif. And in the 500 most influential people in the world, from 2011 till 2021, 
always mashallah in the most honorable they give a list of 50 top people then 10 people who missed the list then 15 people who missed the list so alhamdulillah from 2011 to 2021 for 11 years continuously i was in the list of honorable mentions then in 2019 there was a list of all over the world the 100 most people who collectively worked for 10 years and they ranked me 79 i don't agree with this ranking i don't agree with this ranking it is hard i mean for the rabbi i don't agree that the person was ranked first, first, first of the I'm 97. We did for sake of Allah. I just want to tell you that Allah gives you deen and dunya both. By being the best doctor in the world, I wouldn't have earned so much of fame. I didn't do it for fame. The reason I'm telling you is that our main niya was to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah made a stammerer into one of the best orators, alhamdulillah. Now, come to the second part. Time is short. Mahijra from India to Malaysia. This part is actually longer than the first part, but time is short. Alhamdulillah, till 2007, I started Dawa in 1988, started the organization in 1991, in February, IRF. In the span of 25 years, from 88 to 2007. That was 20 years initially. There was never any, any controversy about me. And I always had a philosophy that if you're doing something on the huck, there's bound to be obstacles. But for me, for the first 20 years, there was no obstacles. No controversy. Mashallah, in my following, Hanafi, Shafi, Hanbali, Maliki, all types of people, Muslims coming and non-Muslims coming and no problem at all whatsoever until when we had the first peace conference 2007. You know, when the banner became bigger and a question was asked to me regarding Yazid, may Allah have mercy, and I said, may Allah have mercy on him. When I said that, in the answer, I won't go to the details, may Allah have mercy on him, I said to Yazid, conference went very fine. Few days later from Pakistan, the Shias of Pakistan, no, oh, how did he say, it? Yazid, Rahimullah, may Allah have mercy, big controversy. Before that, Shias used to call me to give talks because I was on compared to religion. That was the first controversy. I stuck and I gave references from all the scriptures and everything. Second controversy that happened was in 2008 when we did the peace conference Urdu. When we called Urdu speakers from different groups, from different sects on the same platform and they tried to stop the conference. And that was a time in my life when I thought the earth is taken away from my feet. Such a big conference, it will be stopped. It was a small problem that time, but that time I thought it was a big problem. What to do? I went to my cabin, prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next day, the home minister interferes. His son, being a Hindu, he comes and touches my feet. I said, this is not allowed. And the conference goes on, to cut the story short. Third controversy in 2010. In 2010, I had been to UK in 2009. And in UK, when I went in 2009, the head of the counterterrorism department, Charles Farr, he approached me and said, you are very popular. We want you to help us to reach those Muslims who we cannot reach. So I told him, I will help you in two conditions. Number one, you should not ask me to do anything against Quran and Sunnah. Number two, I don't want your money. He agreed. The UK government wanted my help to reach those Muslims who they could not reach because of the popularity of Peace TV. In 2010, the government changes. From Labour Party, you have the Conservative. Because the new government comes, Theresa May, at that time she was the Home Secretary, later she became the Prime Minister. She didn't know me. She said, who is the most popular Muslim speaker in UK? They said, Zakir Nai, him. We cannot, he has not done anything wrong, Banned him. 
Find something in the speech which he spoke against UK. He hasn't spoken against UK. Find something in the speech which is illegal. Nothing illegal. Okay, go to CIA, ask them. CIA said, we have nothing against Dr. Zakir Naik. I said, yet I want to ban him. They said, if you ban him, he will go to the court. She said, I will handle the judges. And she excluded me. The only country officially to exclude me in 2010 was Theresa May. Three weeks she came to power. She didn't know me, but because I was a popular Muslim, then I realized there are two problems, major problems in Dawa. Number one, amongst the Muslim, there are sects who fight against each other. Biggest problem. Number two, in the political arena, the politician non-Muslim, to get his vote bank, he will attack the Muslim dais. So these two are the major problems for Dawa. Number one is Muslims having sex among themselves. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 103, Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. If we Muslims are united, inshallah, no one can interfere with us. And I had a formula to unite the Muslims, but time is short. I cannot touch on that. So I was shocked. The head of the counterterrorism department wants my help and now they want to ban me. So they banned me and my lawyer said, oh, we'll fight the case, we'll win 99.9%. .9%. One of my fans, we had the best of lawyer. He tells me that we will have the best of lawyer, but we will not win, we will lose. We spent more than a million pound only in fighting the government. We lost the case, but we won the battle. Our organization was safe and we went to Supreme Court, we went to the European Court. That was the first experience of political interference. In 2012, one of my staff, he uploaded a video without checking on my Facebook, in which it was my speech, but altered. There was laughter in between, so it gave a wrong picture. That was towards the end of 2012. And I was supposed to come for a lecture tour to Malaysia. It was Ganesh Chaturthi, just maybe a month before that. And there was no problem in India, but some Hindus from Malaysia, they took that clip and made it viral and started complaining. And they told people in India, the first time any non-Muslim objected to my talk was in 2012. Why? In 2007, it was Muslim because from Pakistan, she has complained. In 2012, it was Hindus from Malaysia, some organization. They complained to Hindu organization in India, and there was big, massive protest, first time. The Hindus in India normally love me. They respect me. They revere me. Therefore, for my talk, 25% of the people coming for my talk are non-Muslims. So from 1988 to 2012, there was no problem at all. 25 years, no problem. But some political organization in India took that issue and made a issue out of me and made police complaints. First problem in India regarding non-Muslim 2012. But Alhamdulillah, Allah helped us. We continued. Then in 2014, in India, the BJP government, you may be aware, it's an anti-Islamic party, it's a Hindu fanatic political party, they came to power. And when they came to power, the scenario in India changed slowly. And to cut the story short, in 2016, I was on my trip for Umrah in Mecca, and every year from the year 2002, 3 till for 15 years, every year, the last 11 days or 10 days, me and my family always spent in Mecca. Then after that, went to Medina for a week. We were in Mecca on the 1st of July, 2016. There was a bomb blast in Dhaka. And a newspaper by the name of Star said one of the terrorists, he was a fan of Dr. Zakir Naik on the Facebook. That came in the newspaper on the 3rd of July, 2016. 4th of July, next day, almost all the papers in, in India, Dr. Zakir Naik inspires 
inspired the terrorist of Dhaka bombing. Three days later, that Bangladeshi newspaper corrected. We never said Dr. Zakir Naik inspired. We only said one of the terrorists was a fan of Dr. Zakir Naik. Out of 14 million people that time on my Facebook, if one person, so they said that we never said that newspaper corrected, but the Indian media did not. Then we realized it was a plan and plot of the, of the Indian government. But Alhamdulillah, because of the popularity by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there were protests all over India. So much so that in most of the cities of India, there were protests. And Alhamdulillah, all the Muslim sects, whether Hanafi, Shafi, Hamli, Maliki, Deobandi, all of them supported me, almost all. They said, we may not agree with Dr. Zaki Naik, but he's not a terrorist. There were big protests. So much so that in one month's time, in the parliament, the Indian government said, Dr. Zaki Naik, organization not involved with terrorism. In the parliament they said. And all the protests died down. But it was the plan. When the protests died down, they made a new issue in November about the Muslim personal law. When all the Muslims got together, in between that, on the 17th of November 2016, the Indian government banned my organization. I was outside India, I wanted to come back, do a press conference, they didn't allow me. So I was already outside India, not that I ran away from India. And they banned the organization for five years. At that time, because the Muslims were involved in the Muslim personal law issue, there was no protest, hardly any, and it was their planning. After that, mashallah, I never imagined the red carpet treatment I got from the other countries in the world. I got offers from about 12 to 15 countries. Come and stay here, come and stay here. We'll give you this, we'll give you that. I did my survey. Previously, I traveled as a lecturer, not knowing the ins and out. I took time and I found, according to me, the best country today, if a Muslim has to live, according to me, it is Malaysia. I can give a one hour lecture why Malaysia is the best country, time doesn't permit me. And I said that. Number one, Malaysia is away from the war zone. You know, Gulf country, you know, war zone, Yemen, Syria, what is going on. Number two, it is not under the clutches of the Western power like America, etc. Number three, according to me, the best non-Arab country in the world, in which Muslims are the most practicing, according to me, is Malaysia. An average Muslim in Malaysia an average Muslim in Malaysia is a better practicing Muslim than an average Muslim of India or an average Muslim of Pakistan or an average Muslim of Bangladesh. And this is my own research. And I can give you proofs. Dr. Zakir Naik always proof with proof. On average, uh, um, if you see in Malaysia, in India, how many people pray five times a day? How many? Not less than 10%, some service say less than 5%. How many people pray five times in a mosque less than 2%? Same in Pakistan, same in Bangladesh. In Malaysia, mashallah, according to me, more than 50% pray five times a day. In a mosque, more than 25%. You go to the mall, there are people praying in the mosque. So as a practice in Muslim, except non-Arab countries, Gulf is a different thing, Saudi Arabia is a different thing. The best non-Arab practicing Muslim country is Malaysia. Point number three. Point number, four, point number four, the federal religion of this country, Malaysia, is Islam. Point number five, in most of the countries, in most of the states of Malaysia, where Raja is there, a Muslim can propagate to a non-Muslim, a non-Muslim can't propagate to a Muslim. Point number six, the government funds the mosques and the Islamic activities like Baitul Mal, there is Zakat. And you see, every mosque, now the new mosque coming to Gufran Mosque, the mosque is there, there's a basement, there is a place for the Imam, there is a place auditorium, you go to Kuala Mosque, beautiful. You don't find this in other parts of the world. Point number, point number seven, the country which has the best Islamic economic system, that, that, that interest fee banking, it's in Malaysia. In terms of quantity, Saudi Arabia is number one, but in terms of number, in terms of value of dollars, Saudi Arabia is number one. 
Malaysia is number two. Saudi Arabia, 25 percent. Malaysia, 17 percent of the economy. But in terms of banking system, the easy facility of riba fee banking, it is Malaysia number one. Every bank has has an Islamic Sharia, an interest fee account. Alhamdulillah, there is takaful, there is insurance, and I can go on and go on. Time is short. Next point is Malaysia is a beautiful country. The scenery, the tourism is excellent. You can go to different parts, and tomorrow I'll be trying to Langkawi, mashallah. It was rated as one of the halal tourism. Alhamdulillah. In terms of living, the, the percentage, the expenditure in Malaysia, the standard of living is good, the expenditure is less as compared to the Gulf country. Malaysia, mashallah, is an economically strong country. Now, because of pandemic, most of the countries are down. That's a different thing. And the list is long. Time doesn't permit me. So I chose Malaysia. I never thought in my life before that ever I will have to leave India. I thought they will stop my dhaw. I never thought in my dream that they'll accuse me of terrorism. So they went to the Interpol in 2017 and they requested that Dr. Zakir Naik should have a red corner notice. Then we called a lawyer, a very famous lawyer in UK, and he came to advise me. He said, if any country requests Interpol for terrorism charges, 99.9% .9 they will give it. So I said, why have you come here then? What I can do, I can delay the red corner notice. How long? Two, three months. A nonsense. But Alhamdulillah, when Indian government sent the request to Interpol, Interpol rejected it. Outright. In 2017, they requested. 2018, Interpol had a committee. Mashallah, maybe they saw my cassette. They said, no, Dr. Zakir Naik, there is no evidence he's a terrorist. There's no charge seat filed against him. There's no proof. So again, in 2018, Indian government requested the second time to Interpol, and they changed the charges from terrorism to hate speech. And they gave sample of my hate speech. Interpol again had a meeting in 2019, and they said, no, he does not give hate speech. Then 2019, again they're fresh. Okay, Dr. Zakir, like now they've changed the charges to money laundering. Oh, he's collecting money, he'll be money laundering. What a beautiful reply Interpol gives in 2020, 21, 11 months ago. In February, they write, Dr. Zakir Naik, there's no proof at all he's doing money laundering. If he collects, he has a right, he's following the law of the country where he's collecting. Never do we collect illegally. And it was a slap on the Indian government. There is not a single court in the world which has put any verdict against me. In 2019, in 2018, sorry, when the, when the NIA and the ED, they attached my property, we went to the court. The head of the tribunal, Dr. Manmohan Singh, fortunately, he had seen my videos. He said, I have seen Dr. Zakir Naik's video. Give me one evidence, any one lecture of his, in context, where he supports terrorism, I will attach all his properties. Imagine a Sikh, a non-Muslim, he is saying, the judge is telling the lawyer, I have seen Dr. Zakir Naik's video cassettes. Show me any one lecture of his in context. Where he has promoted terrorism, I will attach all his property and there was a stay. So by law, by court of law, I have not been convicted at all. Yes, because I did not go back for the case, there are arrest warrants against me, but not a single court has convicted me anywhere, nowhere in the world. And Indian government tried the level best with many countries to get me back, including Malaysia. Alhamdulillah, Malaysia has been strong. The government kept on changing. All the government supported me because they knew the truth. They supported the truth. That's the reason I said that Malaysia, mashallah, is a strong country. And mashallah, they do not bend down to pressures of the international. Though the relationship of India and Malaysia is good, but alhamdulillah. And always, mashallah, always, I had no problem at all with as far as the government is concerned. Only problem I had is, as I told you, with the non-Muslim politicians. The non-Muslim politicians of India, now they started me using as a vote bank. 
the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, in his next election in 2019, in less than two minutes, he takes my name seven times. Imagine the Prime Minister of the biggest democracy country in the world, Narendra Modi, in his election rally, he's taking my name seven times in less than two minutes. MashaAllah, I'm honored that the Prime Minister of India to win the election has to take the name of Dr. Zakir Naik, Hazam in Fateh Rabbi. I told them, you want an inquiry, we can have a video conferencing. We can talk. No, come here. People tell me, oh, Dr. Zakir Naik ran away. I said, no, I did hijrah. And that's what a prophet did. When the prophet was persecuted in Makkah, which was the holy city, what he did? He did hijrah. And we get guidance from that. If someone is trying to persecute you, or someone is trying to kill you, what do you do? It's not a question of running away. And after I came to Malaysia, there are many Indian dais and scholars who came to meet me. And one very famous dai, I won't take his name, he said, according to my research, no one in today's world has done hijrah because you are the dai. You are the first one. We are only waiting for Fateh Makkah now. I don't agree that I'm the only dai, but that was his research. And Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah. And one of the reasons I took Malaysia, because percentage-wise, my following in Malaysia is much more than any other country. On my Facebook, there are 22.7 million people. In Bangladesh, about 6 million. Pakistan, 3 million. India, 2.5 million. Indonesia, 1.5 million. Malaysia, 1.5 million. But percentage-wise, there are about 19 million Muslims in Malaysia. 1.5 million of 19 million is approximately 8%. And everyone doesn't use Facebook. Less than 50% use. So percentage-wise, the maximum following that I have anywhere in the world, it's in Malaysia. And even the non-Muslims in Malaysia, to me, the general non-Muslims are very good. It is only the media which attacks me in Malaysia. It is only the non-Muslim politicians who attack me. Otherwise, I had gone to hospital last week. There was an elderly Hindu lady with a tikka. Dr. Zakir Naik, I'm your fan. Can I take a photograph with you? So normally when with ladies, I always want, you know, a maram in between or a gen. So I said, if there's a gen in between, no problem. So she took. Then another person who came from a big company, I won't name the company, a Muslim came, Malay and a Hindu. He said, sir, can I have a photo with you? Before that, I went to a doctor. And he looked like an Indian. I thought he was a Muslim Indian. He said, I cannot charge you. I said, why? I'm your fan. And he gave me his card. He was a Hindu. So like India, even the Hindus here generally are good. It is the political motivated people who for the vote bank, like in India. Like in India, no problem with the Hindus. Even now, it is the political, political vote bank, non-Muslims who want to use religion as a vote bank, they are the problem for the Dawah of the Muslims all over the world. Same thing in UK, same thing in India. So the main Intention is to use religion as a vote bank. So in India, I never had problem. Most of the Indians are fans of mine. Now, when they use the media, they spend millions of dollars in giving newspaper articles against me. Yet today, when I travel and I meet the Indian non-Muslims in foreign countries, they respect me. Even here in Malaysia, most of the Hindus I meet, they respect me. It's only those with the, with the group that belong to a vote bank so these are the two problems of a dai. And mashallah, when I came here to Malaysia, my life changed. My iman increased. My faith in Allah increased. All my properties that were attached, I told my wife, think everything is zero. If you get back, it is bonus. I didn't even bat an eyelid. Oh, we had a lot of properties, a lot of money, everything the government throws. No problem. What is money? All my business is gone. No problem. Didn't bat an eyelid. Hazam in Fazir Rabbe. We restarted. No problem. Allah helps. And our requirement was very low. 2000 ringgit is nothing. Right or wrong? 
Mashallah, people from all over the world. Dr. Zakir, what do you want? Many businessmen, what do you want? We'll give you $10,000 a month. We'll give you $25,000 a month. We'll give you 100,000 yeah. I said, I don't require this. If I collected all, I could have got yearly millions of dollars. I said, I don't require this. My requirement is only 2,000 ringgit and I'm earning much more than that. And I kept on giving the percentage of income. Whatever I earn, I won't tell you the percentage, but majority I give in charity. For all, all the lectures, even today, I pay from my money. Air ticket, car, everything, hotel stay, I pay. I want to maintain even though all my properties have been attached, yet, Hazam in Fazir Rabbi. We never used Dawa as a way of earning money, never. The blessing that Allah has given us in the worldly way is far superior than other things. So my life changed, my iman changed. One thing new that happened, I wasn't too much attached to the social media because of Peach TV. When we came here, my social media, the YouTube had 400,000. Within two years, now it is 3 million, mashallah. 3 million subscribers. My Facebook was 14 million, now it is 22.7 million, mashallah. We spend more time on the social media. Previously, we didn't have time to have weekly sessions. Now we have weekly live question answer session, which is a new series, mashallah. And that has changed. We have gone to different fields of Islam. We have, we met, mashallah, Allah has blessed that we met heads of states of many Muslim countries in the world, even non-Muslim country. I was advised, the religious advice to many of the heads of state. I don't want to name them. And we did what we could with, but always, whenever I meet a head of state, I tell, I have to guide him closer to Quran and Sunnah. And every head of state I met, I saw to it that I gave them Dawah of Deen. I did not think that, okay, I'll be kicked out of the country. I never thought that, you know, I would be harassed. My job as a Dai is to deliver the message. Allah is there to protect me. And mashallah, we changed many things. Time will not permit me to what Allah has blessed, mashallah. But when we came here, mashallah, our ibadat increased. So someone asked me in the question and session, what is the daily routine? And that answer is for more than half an hour. I can't give it now. On average, in India, I have to sleep for three hours. Here in Malaysia, I sleep for about three and a half hours a day on average. Three and a half hours a day on average. Sometimes two hours, sometimes three hours, sometimes four hours on average. And you realize that all the people, all the people who, are, who have reached a level, whether right work or bad work or good work, they sleep less. Most of them, if not all. And, mashallah, coming here, the faith in Allah increased, ibadah increased. First, you know, there are many things among the one thing that increased. That first the tajud was there, it was small. Now the tajud is for about two hours every day, alhamdulillah. So, my working time in India was about 16 hours a day. Here it is about 12 hours a day for dawa. But my time for ibadah increased. My dawa time is yet the 12 hours a day, every day. What I did in Bombay, we had the biggest, largest dawa organization in the world in Bombay. The biggest budget. We had more than 500 people working full time in Bombay alone. Then more than 100 people in Chennai. We had offices in London. Here, I decided where I'm living, I will not have many staff. I have only hardly about four staff. Five staff, bus. Then we have offices in other parts of the world. Because of Zoom, internet, it's easier. So where I'm living, I hardly have five staff. That time I had 500 only in one office in Bombay. One office. The largest private DAO organization in the world. You know, from a budget of 100, from a budget of only $200 a month, that is about $2,500 a year, it became the largest. I won't tell you what the budget was. Alhamdulillah, And Allah blessed us. From a stammerer, he made me an Islamic orator. And my hijrah from India to Malaysia, I never knew that my life would change so much. And we never regretted any time, anything. I only remember the statement of Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, when he was harassed, he said, 
that what can they do to me? What can they do? If they arrest me, I will do ibadah. If they exile me, I will contemplate on Allah. If they execute me, I will be a martyr, I will be a shaheed. Jannah is in my heart. So the more they are trying, Modi sent his emissary to meet me in Malaysia. He sent an emissary to meet me in Malaysia. Dr. Zakir Nai, can we remove the misunderstanding? I said, what misunderstanding? Your police, NI, knows everything about me. There's no misunderstanding. No, can we be friends? I said, no problem. As long as you don't tell me to do anything against Quran and Sunnah, I don't want your money. You know what they wanted me to do? They wanted me to support the government that what they're doing in Kashmir is correct. I said, nonsense. They gave me safe passage. We will get you back to India. We will delete all your cases. I said, what do you want? Nothing you want. Then they're going and telling me, can you say what the Indian government is doing in Kashmir is right? I said, oh, my dead body. In Kashmir, you are persecuting our Muslim brothers. How dare? It's totally wrong. Then they wanted me to support the new act. That is, citizen bill. That, and today, unfortunately, this fanatic Hindu organization is really troubling the Muslims of India. Unfortunately, all the Muslim countries are silent. It's a shame. It's a shame. The largest population of any Muslim in the world today is India. The Muslims in India, according to me, are more than the Muslims in Indonesia. Officially, Indonesia is more. Because the government only says 14.3%, 200 million. According to me, it is 20%. More than 260 million. Anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he utilize us in the best way that he can. We have dedicated our lives for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah accept it. And whatever little we achieved, it is only because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every time our iman keeps on increasing. And I always tell, even in the Dawah training program, that there are three points of success. Number one, Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 160. If Allah helps you, None can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah, number one. Number two, Allah says in Surah Al-Kapud, chapter number 29, verse number 69, if you strive and struggle in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will open up your pathways. If you strive and you don't get success, you are to blame, not Allah. Allah promises that if you strive, you'll get success. So I always tell my staff and my friends and my students, that if you strive, you have to get success. If you don't get success, that means your striving is not correct. And number three is Fasalu Ahl Zikri in Kuntum La Talamun. Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 43 and Surah Ambiya chapter 21 verse number 7. That if you don't know, ask the person who is knowledgeable. That is technique. But with all the technique in the world, if Allah doesn't help you, it's useless. I tell my son, fine, as far as background is concerned, in childhood, until the age of 27, what my son has got a background is thousand times better than me. Half the Quran, no Arabic as a language, graduate of, from Imam Saudi University. But if Allah does not help you, everything is useless. I tell him that you should get Allah's help, that is the best. Degree is no value for the Akhirah. What are you going to do with the degree? And only way you can get Allah's help is if you strive and struggle. See to it that you sacrifice. See to it that you sacrifice the things you like for the sake of Allah. And I always pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may my children strive so that they get the help of Allah. Otherwise, without the help of Allah, all your knowledge, all your training, all your thing is useless. Zero. Have faith in Allah. If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? Strive and struggle, inshallah, you'll be successful. Then ask the person who's knowledgeable. Any field, ask the person who's knowledgeable, inshallah, inshallah, you will get success. I have already spoken for more than two hours, I'm sorry. I have not even scratched the surface. I want to speak many things. I could not, the time was limited, inshallah, when I have the new series, which I intend doing, inshallah, in this year. Maybe more than 25 hours or maybe 30 hours, 40 hours, I don't know. Inshallah, that would be much 
Better? I know I spoke a bit fast towards the end to cover more points. We have a limited time for the question and session. We had more than one hour, but now we'll cut it short to a lesser time. And if you have any questions regarding the topic, my life, my story, from a stammerer to Islamic orator and hijrah from India to Malaysia, you're most welcome to us. So this is the time, inshallah. Wa akhru da'wan alhamdulillah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank mm -hmm. you.